The results of the Paradigm HF trial, for those of you who haven't uh, been familiar with it. It was published about a month ago and it uh, looks at a potentially new drug in the treatment of reduced EF heart failure. So just leading into the discussion, we know that ACE inhibitors have really been the cornerstone of medical therapy for heart failure for many, many years. This, of course, comes from the consensus trial, which was done in the mid-1980s, which really demonstrated that enalapril compared to placebo offered a significant benefit in survival. And, you know, historically, you can see it, a 12-month mortality rate of about 60 percent back in the, in the era of heart failure where we had little to offer these folks. Fast forward ahead, meta-analyses confirmed the benefit of ACE inhibition in heart failure. Um, multiple studies suggest a survival advantage. And then, of course, post-myocardial infarction, whether you have heart failure or not, there is benefit for ACE inhibition. ACE inhibitors are the mainstay uh, in and one of the cornerstones for heart failure management, which is why the study that I'm going to talk about is so interesting and controversial because it now, for the first time, uh, pits ACE inhibitors against a new drug. When we look at all of the drugs we have for low EF heart failure, you can see that there is a, you know, a very impressive mortality benefit for most of them. Meta-analyses suggest that the mortality benefit for ACE inhibitors probably exceeds that for angiotensin receptor blockers, which is why for most of us, ACE inhibition is the first line of therapy in a, uh, in a low EF patient. But when you look at mortality reduction for ACE inhibition, it isn't as great as that has been observed for beta blockers and more recently for MRAs. Regardless, ACE inhibition is an important part of heart failure along the spectrum of heart failure when you have low ejection fraction, whether you're at risk for heart failure or you have asymptomatic structural disease, we are using ACE inhibition. However, even though we use it, these patients still advance to progressive heart failure and their outcomes still in many cases are less than optimal. And so we're looking for new ways to treat this very challenging disease. We know that an important part of the pathophysiology of heart failure um, has to do with um, vasoactive therapy. And we all have circulating endogenous vasoactive peptides, most importantly in heart failure, ANP and BNP, um, which have really beneficial effects in heart disease, including decreasing fibrosis, decreasing hypertrophy, helping with di diuresis, natriuresis, and reducing neurohormonal activation. Interestingly, as you know, the administration of exogenous natri natriuretic peptides does not translate to improved mortality, and that's been studied in drugs like nasiratide. But endogenous, endogenous vasoactive peptides um, may have a role, and neprilysin is uh, a neurohormone or a drug, essentially an enzyme, that results in the breakdown of these endogenous peptides. It can be inhibited by neprilysin inhibition. And so the new drug that was studied in this trial was essentially a, con a drug with two components. It was the component of angiotensin receptor blockade with valsartan and this new idea of neprilysin inhibition. It's not a combination drug. This is a compound that contains both of these agents. And the idea of the drug is that you will get the beneficial effects of neprilysin inhibition, so increasing these endogenous vasoactive peptides in addition to all the beneficial effects of angiotensin, two, angiotensin 1 receptor blockade. And that combination was hypothesized to be beneficial in treating heart failure. And the study design, as we'll talk about, essentially hypothesized that this drug would be better than ACE inhibitors in, producing, in reducing morbidity and mortality in this patient population. Now, the drug doesn't have a name. It's, a, it's called LCZ696. And although this was the largest study of this compound, it wasn't the first study. LCZ696 has been studied in hypertension, and it's been studied in HEFPEF, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Interestingly, this, con this idea or concept of neprilysin inhibition is not new to LCZ. Uh, for those of you who may be familiar, there was a drug not long, not many years ago, called omipatrolat. Omipatrolat was used to treat hypertension. It was an ACE inhibitor combined with neprily a neprilysin inhibitor. It did a great job at reducing blood pressure. It did a great job at reducing um, BNP and neurohormonal activation, but it didn't translate to any morbidity and mortality benefit in heart failure, and actually resulted in a significant increase in angioedema. And so the drug was taken off the market. And for that reason, 
Neprilysin inhibition is not combined with an ACE inhibitor because of the marked increase in bradykinin. It's only combined with an ARB. So what do we know about this drug? As I said, in large studies looking at hypertension, compared to valsartan alone, this LCZ compound had a much better reduction in blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. A couple of years ago, the study was looked at this drug, LCZ, was looked at in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The primary endpoint was a reduction in BNP, and you can see that LCZ had a significant reduction in BNP, and also compared to valsartan alone, resulted in improvement in clinical composites uh, as well as NYHA functional class. Those clinical improvements were independent of the blood pressure effect. So already in HEFPEF, there was this suggestion that this new drug, LCZ, might have a beneficial effect above and beyond what we get from valsartan that is independent of hypertension. So that really paved the way for this large study, which is what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. Now, the study was published in the New England about a month ago, and the, the design of the study was essentially to compare LCZ, so this new combination, if you will, uh, um, Losartan plus, or Valsartan plus neprilysin inhibition, compared to enalapril alone in patients with low EF heart failure. It was a very large study. It was an international study. Patients had to have systolic dysfunction, and as most of you probably know, the study was terminated prematurely because of significant benefits in the primary endpoint in favor of this new drug, uh, the primary endpoint being CV death or hospitalization. So going into it in a little bit more detail, these were adult patients with mo mild, moderate, or very few severe heart failure patients who had to have systolic dysfunction. The BNP initially, or sorry, the EF initially was 40%, and they cut it back to 35%. BNP had to be elevated unless they had a recent hospital admission, and then the cut points were reduced. If you had low blood pressure, if you had moderate or severe chronic kidney disease or a history of angioedema, you were not eligible to participate in this trial. This is really important. I want to spend some time on this um, because there were two essentially run-in phases for this study. So all these patients had low EF heart failure. They were all treated with ACE or ARB. That drug had to be stopped. When that drug was stopped and, and there was no therapy for a short period of time, patients were then given enalapril, up to 10 milligrams BID. If they tolerated the enalapril, it was stopped, and then they were treated with LCZ at 100 milligrams BID for about two weeks. If they tolerated that drug, then it was increased to 200 milligrams BID, and they were treated there for about two weeks. Now, LCZ at 200 milligrams twice a day is equivalent to um, the uh, Valsartan dose at about 340 milligrams a day, so maximum dose of the ARB. If they could tolerate that step up, then they were enrolled or then they w went on to the randomized double blind portion where they got either LCZ or enalapril at 10 milligrams BID won't project well, so I've, I've just to basically give you an idea of how that, that run-in period affected enrollment, they enrolled over 10,000 patients, they lost about 10% after the enalapril uh, run-in, and then they lost another 1,000 patients after the LCZ run-in. And at the end of that run-in period, they were ready to randomize, uh, they are ready to uh, basically assign treatment to eight, just over 8,000 patients. So who were these patients? Again, uh, on the left, basically, I want to emphasize the, the, that these were very typical low EF heart failure patients. Most of them were men. The average EF was 30%. Most of them had ischemic disease, um, and um, many of them had had a recent heart failure admission. This is important. Were they well-treated heart failure patients? For the most part, their medical therapy was excellent. The far majority were on beta blockers. A good chunk of them were on MRAs, perhaps not as many as should be in this trial, but we can talk about why. However, there was a very low rate of ICD and CRT use, and you can see that here. So this is really the money slide. The primary endpoint was a composite of death from CV causes or hospitalization for heart failure. The study was terminated early. You can see this is the composite primary endpoint, 20% relative risk reduction in favor of LCZ. Compared to enalapril, this is not a placebo comparison. The number needed to treat was 21. The two components of the primary endpoint, death from CV cause or hospitalization for heart failure, again, very statistically significant reductions in these endpoints. Death from CV causes a number needed to treat of 32. To, again, a 20% relative risk reduction on top of enalapril. Hospitalization for heart failure, same thing. 
One of their secondary endpoints was all-cause death. You can see that all-cause death was reduced by 16%. 16% is twice the improvement in all-cause mortality that was seen with any ACE inhibitor. So this is really very, very novel and very interesting. Very profound improvements in primary and secondary endpoints with this compound. To sh illustrate subgroup analysis, because we all want to know, well, who benefited and who didn't. If I'm going to have this drug, who am I going to prescribe it with? You can see that the, the, on the left are the LCZ improvement. This is primary endpoint. This is death from CV causes. Just your eye can tell you that almost in all of these pre-specified subgroups, there was benefit in favor of LCZ. So whether you were very old or not so old, regardless of your sex, regardless of whether you were treated in North America or internationally, Regardless of your EF, regardless of your BNP, you benefit from this drug. Regardless of whether you're on an ACE or an ARB or an MRA at baseline, you benefited. Who didn't benefit? The only people that didn't benefit from this drug were people who were not in class two. So if you were in class three or four, you didn't benefit. And about, you can see the numbers are small, which contributes, but that's really the only time the lines cross unity. Secondary endpoints included quality of life, which were also statistically in favor of LCZ, and no, no changes in incidence of AFib or worsening GFR. In terms of safety endpoints, again, this drug is a profound vasodilator. You get hypotension, and hypotension was much more common in LCZ. Indices of worsening renal function were not significantly different. If anything, there was a trend that they were greater in the enalapril arm. So potassium, worsening creatinine, all of those things didn't, didn't pan out to be important. Angioedema, which is a concern with neprilysin inhibition, was not greater in the LCZ arm. And so the authors and investigators made a very strong conclusion, and they said that this drug should replace the use of ACE inhibitors in the chronic treatment of heart failure. A very strong conclusion based on these very interesting results. So as we think about that, we have to understand a little bit, who are these patients in paradigm, and are they like other clinical trials? And in fact, the answer is yes. Most of these patients were very well treated with medical therapy, 93%, very similar to other recent heart failure trials that have shown morbidity and mortality benefit. This is an issue. Why these patients didn't have defibrillators does need to be addressed. The use of the, M, the low, relatively yo, low use of MRA in this patient population probably reflects the fact that when these patients were being randomized, um, we weren't treating class two patients with MRAs. That's, that's, that's a newer medical therapy that we, uh, we really only are offering it to class three patients, uh, and, so, and most of these patients were class two. So what about the results? How do they compare against other heart failure trials? And you can look at number needed to treat uh, all-cause death is 35 in this study, which is similar to many other heart failure trials that we've done. So the patients are relatively similar. The results are relatively similar. So is this, does this imply then that this drug is actually better than ACE inhibitors? And is this going to change how we practice chronic heart failure? I think that's really the question that needs to be answered. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the thoughts that I have about this trial, and, you know, and then we can talk on, on a you know, more greater spectrum. When you look at this trial, there's a few things you have to be cognizant of. The first is that they used a dose of 10 milligrams BID of enalapril, and they compared it to the equivalent of 340 milligrams of Valsartan. Now, some would say that 10 BID is a moderate dose, and that's a high dose of Valsartan. Consensus, the first ACE study I showed you, used 20 milligrams BID of enalapril, so, uh, so a much higher dose. In critique or defense of that, the authors of this study will say, but the average dose of enalapril in this study was 18 milligrams daily. If you look at um, later heart failure trials that used enalapril, the average dose achieved was 16. So they're suggesting that they actually are on target and that most patients wouldn't tolerate 20 BID of enalapril. We really don't know, like in any randomized trial, how these drugs changed over time. I think the intolerance piece is a big piece. 14% uh, of patients or 12% of patients were had to leave the study during that run-in phase because of hypotension. Over the duration of the study, 18% of these patients had to be withdrawn from the study because of hypotension. Now, we don't know what this drug would do if you've never been exposed to ACE or ARBs. All patients were on that therapy before they started this study. 
how profound these hypotensive effects would be if you weren't already uh, in some way proven yourself to be able to tolerate these drugs, really unknown, right? We, we don't know the answer to that. I think we also need to consider the low use of devices in this study. We know nothing about the percentage of left bundle branch block. We don't know why there was such a low use of CRT, but that needs to be explained. We also, that's my apologies for the typo, that should say ICD. We also don't know why ICD use was so low in this study, but that also, we need to consider that as we think about these results of the trial. And probably also importantly to discuss is we don't know why this drug works. I've talked about what neprilysin inhibition does, but the mechanism of benefit in this study remains to be seen. There were really no, um, there were no mechanistic studies on this drug in low EF heart failure. Obviously, that's something that needs to be discussed, but ventricular remodeling, um, neurohormones, all of those things really weren't studied in this, in this uh, pure clinical trial. And I think also as we look at heart failure patients and we add and add and add on drugs, we need to understand how all these drugs fit together, especially when we only have so much blood pressure to work with. Um, so we know that all of these drugs improve morbidity and mortality, that's why we're using them, but we don't tailor our therapy in heart failure to know if we add this drug, should we decrease the beta blocker, or should we just go with lots of beta blocker and little ACE inhibitor, or should we be using LCZ now at maximum doses and very little doses of all these other medications. There's no data to guide us on that, and so it does as clinicians treating heart failure patients adds to some complexity. All that being said, I think this is absolutely a landmark trial. This study, for the first time, demonstrated a very powerful effect on morbidity and mortality in low EF heart failure patients. I also want to bring up this idea that we, we tend to think of functional class 2 stable patients as functional class 2 stable patients. This study reinforced the idea that no heart failure patient is really that stable. These were well, walking well, class 2 patients that we see every day, and yet on the absolute best medical therapy, notwithstanding device use, that they, we could offer them, the, one, the annual mortality was still 7%. So it still reminds us that heart failure is a very significant disease, and despite optimal medical therapy, the mortality is not benign for this patient population. So if you ask me, what am I going to do, or who might be a candidate, I think I would reinforce the idea that these were clinically stable patients. They had very mild heart failure symptoms. Seventy percent of them were class two. I think that if you're going to look at LCZ as a possibility for therapy, you have to really understand that these patients need to have stable blood pressure. You need to be able to get up to the doses that were shown to be effective in this clinical trial. We have no data to suggest that anything less than 200 milligrams of LCZ will be better than an ACE inhibitor. We do not know that, but we do know that low doses of ACE inhibitor are better than no doses of ACE inhibitor. I also think that it should be remembered if this drug, and I anticipate it will come to market, this is not a rescue drug. These patients who went into this clinical trial were not failing class 3 heart failure patients. These were your walking well, stable class 2 patients. LCZ is not designed to be a rescue drug, and it shouldn't be a rescue drug. And that this issue with bradykinin is not insignificant. If you're familiar with omipatrolat, you know that that was a, a very important issue. And in this study, all drugs were dis all ACE was discontinued at least 36 hours before this drug was used. And so, if it does come to uh, come to market, we need to remember that if we're drug switching from one class to another, we need to leave a large window between an ACE inhibitor and the administration of LCZ. So I'll stop there for any questions, and thank you.